Hello and welcome to the Political Opinions Podcast, where every opinion is given equal footing and political tolerance and debate are given their proper attention in a world where both are on the decline. Today's episode will go over the different opinions regarding how powerful a nation's armed forces should be. A nation's military has always been one of its most fundamental institutions regarding self-defence and projecting its power around the world. As more focus is placed on economic development and cooperation, however, it is put into question if a nation still needs a powerful armed forces. While there are many sides to this debate, the two sides for this specific episode will be that there should be a weaker defensive army or a more powerful army capable of offence. The aim of this episode will not be to try and convince you of which side is right regarding how powerful a nation's armed forces should be, but rather to highlight the two sides to the debate and provide a comparison between them. I'll begin with the arguments that a nation should have a powerful offensive armed forces, followed by the arguments its military should be weaker and focus purely on defence, with a comparison at the end. People who advocate for a strong military tend to view it in terms of the capability to project power around the world. The US Navy, for example, has seven fleets, and as such, it can project military power at any coastal point on the planet. Having a powerful military allows states to use them to pursue their interests, thereby making them more powerful. A stronger offensive military can also provide a disincentive for would-be oppressors. No country in the world has anywhere near the might needed to take on the US armed forces, and as such, no country will likely ever engage in a war with them, given the current relative strength between nations. And as such, the US is essentially guaranteed not to be invaded. If a country limits its army to defence and is weaker, it may create the idea to aggressors that they can strike decisively, compared to the fear that a stronger military may represent. Having a stronger military also helps to ensure other nations adhere to commitments given the threat of military action if they don't. If a country fears military action and is aware that they cannot win, then there is more of a reason to commit to agreements. Strong militaries can also help protect economic interests abroad. For example, the US and UK navies have been vital in countering the Iranian aggression in the Strait of Hormuz, through which 21% of the world's oil, tra- oil travels. Therefore, a strong military can protect economic capabilities and the ability of trade to function. And it also can be used, for example, to stop pirates for coastal shipping. A stronger military also encourages weaker nations to bandwagon to that stronger state, further increasing a nation's power and influence. Europe, for example, has remained very close to America, in part due to NATO's dependence on American money and military power to counter Russian aggression. Therefore, having a stronger army encourages other states to follow you. Having a strong army on the other side could also reduce reliance on others. Macron, for example, wants an EU army, so the USA isn't needed, and while that's an EU army, not a French army, it still represents the idea that a strong army means a state can follow its own actions and not be dependent on the wishes of a bigger military power. State's military doesn't rely on a big economy. Although a big economy enables spending on a bigger army, a big army can exist without a super strong economy. Russia, for example, is disproportionately more powerful militarily than economically, and it means that Russia has continued to be a global military superpower, despite the fact that it is very far from an economic superpower and can still extend its influence around the world. A strong military can also help in humanitarian relief, such as natural disaster support, and having a strong army enables you to do good for the world and increase your standing with other nations. Therefore, A bigger army makes you more powerful, so a lot of people would advocate for a stronger military. Therefore, having stronger armed forces simply increases your nation's power, and that is a strong incentive to some to increase the nation's military power. There are those, however, who question whether military power is both important and can actually produce results. North Korea, for example, compared to the USA, has an infinitely weaker armed forces. But what it does have is nuclear weapons, and as such, the USA can do essentially nothing to North Korea militarily out of the threat that North Korea poses in regards to nuking Seoul, for example. So nukes, some would say, negates all military power, and as such, if a country possesses nuclear weapons, they do not need a strong army. Furthermore, as in the case of Syria, the USA can't do whatever it wants militarily. 
While the USA is a lot stronger than Russia, Russia still possesses an army capable enough to inflict such high costs and casualties on America and its army that a war with them isn't viable. This is a strong idea regarding a defensive military, whereby you don't need to have the capability, rather, to attack other nations. All you need is the ability to inflict such high costs that a war isn't viable. Economic power, such as that displayed by China, has also shown how strong other factors can be compared to the military. China can exert economic influence with essentially any weaker economy in the entire world, and while their army isn't as strong, the reliance today on global economic interdependence means that to some economic power is far more important, and that should be the focus rather than military power. Democracies such as the USA, for example, also oppose, in the most part, sending soldiers to their deaths for something that isn't the defence of their na nation. And as such, the USA cannot engage in large military interventions very easily because, for example, of the backlash seen in Iraq to the high numbers of US casualties. Large militaries are also expensive and come at a cost. Russia has a very poor economy and most people there live in relative poverty compared to other European nations. And some would question whether all of those costs are necessary if the benefits to a stronger military aren't that good. Countries such as those in Western Europe are also unlikely to be attacked given they have economic interdependence with each other and their geopolitical um, location means that other countries don't really need to attack them. And as such, they don't need a very strong military, they just need one strong enough to defend their own territory if they were attacked. Many countries are also in alliances, so for example the members of NATO don't need an individual strong army because their collective forces are much greater than most oppressors, and while they do rely greatly on America, the whole idea of a collective armed forces means that your own individual army doesn't have to be that strong. Most countries today also don't have an innate desire to expand and use their military around the world. The focus is more on economic power and influence, and as such, you don't need to have a super strong army because no one's really going to attack you. And in the case of Syria, for example, the USA has been unwilling to act and a lot of countries don't want to have an offensive army. They don't want to send their soldiers to die and spend money to go and fight wars that are very far from their own country. And finally, humanitarian aid can be done without a massive army. The UK still participates in humanitarian relief, yet their army isn't exactly massive with only 100,000 troops. And as such, you don't need an immensely strong offensive army in order to either protect yourself or exert influence given that can be done, for example, economically. Moving on now to the comparison, on the idea of nuclear weapons, advo those advocating a strong army would say that most countries don't have nuclear weapons and or are unlikely to use them. So there is still a case to have a strong regular army. Well, those on the other side would say that countries with nukes don't need a strong army as they have the strongest deterrent possible. And the USA's army can do nothing to North Korea, given that North Korea possesses nuclear weapons. In regard to projecting power around the world, those with a strong army would say that it is important to project a nation's power around the world through the military. It's an effective means, for example, to spread democracy, spread ideas, spread your ability to influence other nations' actions. But those on the other side would say that either there are other means, for example, economic and cultural power, or there's just not a desire to project your power. Why does the UK need to have loads of influence, for example, in the East Indies, for example? It doesn't really make sense. There's more of an, if there's an economic, economic interest, they can exert economic power, but there isn't really a need to project strong military power around the world. Regarding self-defence, those advocating for a strong army would say that a strong military is a, is a very effective deterrent from being attacked and is more likely to prevent you being invaded than a weaker army. But those on the other side would say that, is, that if the army is capable of defence and is capable of defending your nation, you don't need anything more. Most countries don't have a strong enough desire to invade another nation, especially when the cost could be high enough, even with a weaker army, to be inflicted on the invaders. Regarding alliances, those advocating a strong army would say either that having a strong military means that you control an alliance and more countries are willing to ally with you and therefore you have more collective strength, 
or that you're so strong that you don't even need to enter an alliance. So if you disagree with other countries, you're strong enough to go it alone. But those on the other side would say that alliances exist where collective strength is greater. You can essentially balance a bigger army by combining lots of nations, smaller armies together, and that a big army isn't needed when it comes to alliances, and that the very existence of alliances negates the need for a big army. And then finally, perhaps the most important point is the idea of economic power. Those in favour of a strong military would say that they go hand in hand, that a military helps to ensure economic power and other countries stick to agreements, and also this idea that you can have a strong military without having a strong economy. While those on the other side would say that economic power in itself is all you really need and is more important than military power, and that cooperation means wars between trading partners is is unlikely, so you don't need a strong military as you're unlikely to go to war. But if you have a strong economy, you can influence and exert power on other countries. Overall, those in favour of strong militaries are more likely to be the same people who tend to advocate for intervention and spreading of a nation's power around the world, while those who advocate for a weaker and defensive military are more likely to be concerned with domestic and economic affairs and that a military is only a tool to defend a state from potential attackers. This debate will continue long into the future, just as it always has existed as long as there are states, and as the USA becomes less economically powerful relative to China, it will be interesting to see how and if they turn more to their military strength. And in the time when China surpasses, potentially, America economically, it will show the true capabilities of a stronger military compared to an economy, assuming, of course, that the US maintains its relative military strength. But ultimately, though, what do you think on this topic? Is there anything I missed, got wrong, could do better? Let me know in the comments or on Twitter, and be sure to check back on Friday for the different opinions on how the government should respond to a second wave of coronavirus. Thank you for listening, and I hope to see you all soon.